live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. We're going to find out how antioxidants such as flavanol is linked to a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Who says? Rush University, published in the Peer Review Journal Neurology. So drinking some juices, that would be my suggestion, but also eating fruits and vegetables, even having green tea is going to flood your body with some very healthy flavanols, and that it's going to lower your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. And a lot more on health and healing. Then we're going to take a look at three issues. Crisis in our classrooms. Now I know that there are a lot of teachers listening. From part-time teachers to full professors and chairmen of departments. I'd like to have your feedback. I'd like to have the average person's feedback. I'd like to have the feedback of people who went to school in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s and compared to what that means to be in a classroom today. I'd like to hear from parents whose children were in classrooms then. How did that work? And about parents whose children are in classrooms today. What is the difference? Now, communication is between generations is still viable of understanding what was and what is and what should be. We'll be playing that 10-minute clip, and I'm going to ask you to Call in and share your points of view. Also, the real reasons that you should be afraid of artificial intelligence. Peter Haas. And from Leanna Wynn, what your doctor won't disclose, but should. From a TED Talk. We have a lot to share. We begin with the people who are wise enough to be eating a really good plant-based diet loaded with fruits and vegetables. The more of those green vegetables, the more of those red fruits you put in your body, the less likely you are to suffer from Alzheimer's, which is a form of dementia. This is according to an article in Neurology published in the American Academy of Neurology. It's really simple. It's not complicated. The more that you do in the way of transferring from an unhealthy diet to a healthy diet, you can add years onto your lifespan. Why? Because of the phyto, P-H-Y-T-O, chemicals found in plant pigments that are known to be beneficial for your health. So that's the latest study there. Uh, we're talking about having kale and apples and tomatoes. And each one, whether it's oranges or green tea, they all have special chemicals. For example, if I were to say, okay, I'm going to eat some pears, some olive oil, uh, some tomato sauce, and green beans, black-eyed peas, spinach, broccoli, all of those are able to lower your blood pressure. All of those are able to prevent heart disease and stroke. All of those are able to lower your risk of Alzheimer's dementia. Simple, not complicated. Many of you were down at the Healing Springs Ranch, which, by the way, still exists. I haven't been there since I left it in 1995. And that's when I went to Florida and purchased for my brother the, uh, the Paradise Gardens. It was just a sand lot way off the ocean, back by itself, out in the boondocks. And today it's, it's not the same. It's more than a sandlot. It's very pretty. I've planted uh, over 2,000 palm trees of different types. Some are now considered specimen trees. And creating an environment where animals that have been abused or abandoned um, can find their health back, happiness, and, and then be given a home for life or let back out into the wilds. At least those are that I can. Some you can't because they wouldn't survive. And along the way, you learn a lot about animals. And one of the things you learn is, boy, they are a lot like humans. 
in their best sense. I posted a little video today showing a monkey feeding its baby with a baby bottle. And everything that that little mother is doing with her baby, a real mother, you know, a human mother would do, giving it kisses and, and uh, grooming it, feeding it the bottle. You ought to see it. It so warms your heart, brings a smile on your face. But going back to the uh, Healing Springs Ranch, I had a lot of animals that were dropped off there. Each, each morning, my brother would go by the gate and there'd be something out there. Might just be an old cow tied up in a little note. Didn't want to slaughter it. It's old. Heard you take in animals. Sometimes I get a lot of animals. Trailers of animals when a circus or a, a safari uh, farm ranch would close down, and I'm glad they do because they put these stupid Americans and others into pickup trucks and take them out to some grazing animals, and then with camouflage outfits on and high-powered microscopes, they or uh, telescopes, they, they kill innocent animals just grazing. I mean, what kind of person does that? What is missing in a person's life that you feel that you have to go kill an animal to prove something? Wow. <clears throat> and by the way, the president's two sons do that. In any case, we take in the animals and get them back to health. I never will forget my brother was an animal whisperer. One day we got a herd of buffalo in. Now these are not tame animals. These are wild animals. And a big buffalo, big alpha buffalo, goes about 1,400 pounds. It's very territorial. My brother just walks right out to it and starts petting it. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> Howard, you're really putting your life in your hands. He didn't see it that way. He was right. <clears throat> I wouldn't recommend anyone else do it, but he did it. And then we started seeing how all the cows love to be hugged. The little heifers, which are newborn cows, they love to be petted and hugged. All the animals love to be hugged. And I remember having a retreat in 1990, and there was one guy there who was really uptight. He was always anxious. Turns out he worked on Wall Street. He was a high-powered lawyer, very stressful environment. And his wife insisted he come because he had been unbearable being around, she said. Okay. I said, go out and hug a cow. He thought I was crazy. I said, try it. I'll go out with you. Went out to the pasture. There was this big mother cow, and he just went up, and I said, look, put your arms around her neck and hug her. He did, reluctantly. Two days later, that's where he spent every day. It calmed him out, chilled him out, rebalanced him. This is from psychology today, today. Hug a cow, the new psychotherapy. It may improve your mood even if you feel silly doing it. How about that? <coughs> Excuse me. So it seems like every day someone comes up with a new therapy that's going to make us feel better about ourselves. But cow cuddling is a variation of equine therapy that is working, spending an hour hugging a cow, resting your head while it lays down to chew its cud, or taking a part in its grooming, all of that is good for you. Out of all the places I've ever owned, and I've lived on a farm or a ranch for more than 50 years, I always have animals, rescue animals. All of them have been sanctuary animals. And any time that I'm able to work with people who are really stressed, especially vets, I get them to bond with an animal. And in that process of bonding with the animal, you just see the stress coming right out of them. A lightness of being occurs. So it may sound foolish, but it can help relieve anxiety and depression. And by the way, there's a place in Colorado 
and there's a place nearby, only a block from where I'm at. In fact, I just visited him recently. I supported him. I gave him a check to help him. It's a wolf sanctuary, and there are all these wolves. And the wolves seem to have some instinctual knowledge that a person is going through post-traumatic stress disorder and bonds with them. And so I'm getting some uh, therapy wolves for the uh, Veterans Village that I'm opening as soon as this retreat is over, this anti-aging study is over a week afterwards I open it up. I'll be bringing in the first 10 homeless vets. These are homeless. I'm picking up the total bill. They'll get the best therapy in the world, humanistic, holistic therapy, no medications. My goal is within six months to have these people be able to return to a happy, healthy life with their families and back into society <clears throat> without living with post-traumatic stress disorder or Gulf War syndrome. But the wolves are very important. There are only special type of wolves that can do this. And you see the video, the, the, the wolf sanctuary out in Colorado. A wolf will go over and adopt a person when they come in. And then every time that person goes, just that wolf will go over and just bomb with him. And they just, you know, they'll play together. And, and uh, it's just remarkable what happens when you start to look at creatures as sentient instead of just objects. Something to think about. Going vegetarian may lower your risk of interuterine infections in women from the Zhu Chi University in Taiwan. So get rid of the meat, get rid of the sugar, and watch your reduction in urinary tract infections, at least in women. That's what the study shows. And that is good. We have all millions of women in the United States to get these inner uterine uh, infections, mainly because of E. coli, and that could help prevent the growth of that. So this was published in the Journal of Scientific Reports. Also, the best way to treat a burn and initially and immediately, according to University of Queensland, and published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, run cold water over your burn. Yeah. New research in the January edition of Annals of Emergency Medicine reveals that cooling with running water is the best initial treatment for a burn, especially children's burns, because it can substantially reduce the odds of needing a skin graft. It will expedite healing and lessen the chance that a young burn victim requires admission to a hospital for an operation. Something simple, right in front of us. And from Arizona State University comes a study about the consumption of leafy green salads. Yeah, what's it do? Improves your cardiovascular health, especially if you're postmenopausal. Postmenopausal women have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease than men of the same age and even far more than premenopausal women. That's because of the loss of estrogen, which promotes vasodilation through nitric oxide. There's that wonderful nitric oxide, <clears throat> and that's the link. And early studies have supported the use of dietary nitrate supplements, and, but those are mainly have historically been used by athletes. So researchers used a controlled crossover trial to determine whether eating a High nitrate leafy green salad could improve biomarkers for cardiovascular health in postmenopausal women, and it did. So good. Eat lots of salads, eat big salads. Recently, I heard about a skeptic who says, Well, we don't believe in traditional Chinese medicine or traditional Ayurvedic medicine, even though it, one's been around for 5,000 years, another's been around for 2,000 years, and they're hundreds of thousands of clinicians board certified using it, billions of people benefiting from it. They like to think that the only thing of value is what is found in a test tube. This is from Kew Gardens in the United Kingdom. A study finds that nearly 30,000 plant species are used as medicine around the world. 30,000. 
Yeah, they've been around a while, and they're very important. And they're used in a lot of medicines. So these people, by saying there's no benefit to any of this plant-based medicine, <clears throat> they're wrong. And then again, they're wrong about everything. Combining antioxidants like astaxanthin can inhibit the cells that are adversely affected by neurotoxicity, meaning in lay language that when you're using antioxidants, especially those that are red, that would mean red plums, blood oranges, red apples, red peppers, red raspberries, strawberries, tomatoes, you're actually protecting your neurons and your brain. And for University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA researchers find chronic inflammation contributes to cancer metastasis. So one more reason that you want to lower those cytokines, cyto, C-Y-T-O, kine, K-I-N-E, or the interleukin, I-N-T-E-R-L-E-U-K-I-N, want to lower those because when those are elevated because you're drinking alcohol or you're stressed or you're eating high acidic foods, you're creating pro-inflammatory conditions, even leading a person into local acidosis. That contributes to the spread of cancer. That's imp important. And for University Hospital of Bonn, which is in Germany, high and low exercise intensity found to influence brain function differently. Guess which one improves brain function? High intense exercise. Guess which one does not? Low intense. I've said this for a long time. I see a lot of people exercising. They're making an effort, but they're doing it casually. It's called a junk exercise. You really don't benefit from it. And a new study shows for the first time that low and high exercise intensities differentially influence brain function. So they use some MRIs on that, which is a non-invasive technique that allows for studies on brain connectivity. And the researchers discovered that um, you need those high intense exercises because it activates the networks involved in effective emotion processing. The results were in the brain plasticity and that's in improving cognition. So, good news. And finally, honey reduces the risk of heart disease. From Ishvan University and Mashhad University, in a cooperative effort between two research medical schools, they found that honey has been shown to aid the body in healthy processing of fats by decreasing the overall amount of cholesterol and fats in the bloodstream. And it was just published in the European Journal of Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, also in clinical nutrition. So, raw, organic honey, you bet. It's really good for you. That's the latest on health and healing. We are 18 minutes into our program. I'm Gary Nall. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back from the break and go directly into classrooms in crisis and the outbreak outbursts, plaguing Oregon classrooms, and then I'd like for you to use your insights to see what you see as the problem, because there has to be a progenitor, there has to be an underlying cause, and therefore what could be the solution? Our talkback number is 888-874-4888, 888-874-4888, back in a moment. I'm KGW investigative reporter. 
problem is already at a crisis level. Tonight you'll hear from teachers across the Portland metro area, including Portland, Beaverton, North Clackamas, Hillsboro and Gladstone. What they told us was clear. This is impacting all of their students and something needs to change. these eight elementary school teachers from all different districts to tell us what they're seeing every day. Raise your hand if you believe classroom disruptions are at a crisis level. Everybody. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. This is a day after day experience in many classrooms. Literal screaming, like they're screaming for help, literally. And so sometimes that comes out in, you know, suicide threats or death mm. threats. They are throwing furniture, they're running through the building, going to the office, throwing chairs at windows. Um, and it's, it's really intense. We've seen students hurting other students or throwing other belongings. Um, students uh, throwing tables over, throwing chairs at adults, at other students, wood blocks. Um, I've been called every name in the book. And it's traumatizing for other kids to see yes. you being physically harmed. Have any of you been hurt? I've been punched and kicked and uh, I've had colleagues bitten, uh, slapped. Scratched. Yeah, scratched with finger, fingernail. I've had fingernail marks down my arm. You're saying this happens a lot. Oh yeah. Daily. Absolutely. Oh, it's Daily. every day. Building. Every day. Every day. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think parents are aware of really what goes on unless they volunteer, but so many parents aren't aware of what's going on in our schools. Those types of experiences have become so commonplace that like, kids don't go home and talk about it anymore. Classroom disruptions aren't always tracked by districts, but employee injuries are. In Beaverton, 72% of the nearly 1,800 employees injured since 2017 were caused by students. In Salem-Kaiser, who only had numbers for this year, it was 73%. And in Hillsboro, 65% of employee injuries were caused by students over the last two school years. Some of the descriptions of those incidents include a kindergarten student swinging a metal rod at a teacher, another kindergartner punching a teacher in the stomach, and an elementary school student spraying cleaning spray into a teacher's eyes. I don't think the students no. want to hurt someone. They just don't know how to communicate their feelings. And when the most serious outbursts happen, the teachers don't remove the student melting down. They have to send all of the other students out of the room. It's called a classroom clear. A room clear is pretty much where a student is so dysregulated that your students are not safe. And when I'm by myself, I just tell my students to walk in and the other teacher will know what it means. Teachers say the clear outs lead to a loss of learning they can't get back. Think of that student who in kindergarten lost so many hours of instruction yes. because the teacher was busy helping those kids with high needs. Mm -hmm. By the time they reach me in fifth grade, they're lacking some fundamental skills that are multiple grade levels behind. If a student is flipping out, mm -hmm. you cannot touch them. Is that correct? I mean, by law, you cannot touch them in any way. That's correct. Does Unless that... they're about to inflict um, physical harm on themselves. Um, then, you know, you might want to try to go in and, and calm them down as best as you can, but really no, no touching whatsoever. And that's what leads to the hurting. Yes. When your kids yes. are in the street. We do a lot of hurting. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of hurting. Yeah. Hurting is when teachers have to try and guide students to safety without touching them, even if they run away. Often they try to run around you. Well, they see it as a game. And mm -hmm. so for yes. a lot of these children, now you're playing chase with them. And instead of having to learn, they get to run around in location of their choice. Raise your hand if you believe that the current laws allow you to deal with these disruptions in the best way. No one. You have teachers who say, I'm afraid to grab a kid who's about to run out into the street. That's the way that we are being told that we're supposed to deal with this, and that's ridiculous. Representative that Barbara Smith-Warner and lawmakers across Oregon and across the aisle told us they've heard these stories for months. I heard a story about a kindergartner breaking the eardrum of their teacher. I heard stories about second graders throwing a chair through a window. And one situation where one of those students um, had some scissors and actually did a situation where he was going to hurt her. The student ran into the road and again the 
principal could not touch the student but had to herd him out of the road and make sure that the cars were aware that there was a situation going on. Why is the disruptive child not pulled from the classroom? Why is that child left in the classroom and others, all others, are pulled out? State Representative Brian Clem heard it from his own daughter. And she said, oh yeah, a first grader yelled, and I don't want to say it, horrible obscenities. As, mad, as bad as you can imagine, she said the first grader yelled them for an hour. And no one, no one could do anything except wait, just wait. Clem asked that why the matter. teachers were clearing out teach. rooms and hurting students. At first I was like, oh, what? why are you doing that? And they're like, well, you passed it. What are you talking about? Why are we doing it? You passed this thing. And we're like, I don't remember voting for that. And they said, well, the way it got interpreted was, yeah, you really can't touch them at all. Both Clem and Smith Warner point to a law passed in 2011 and amended in 2013 that says a teacher can only physically restrain a student when there is the threat of imminent serious bodily injury. The law was passed in response to an increased number of special needs students being restrained or put in isolation rooms. You believe this is really a problem with how the law is being interpreted. We pass legislation to respond to a problem and in responding to that problem we inadvertently create another problem and so it's Let's get the pendulum back to a, to a good place. It's an absurd interpretation of the law, probably, but whatever. We'll just fix it and go back to what we had before. Representative Clem is co-sponsoring a bill that would allow educators to physically assist students without fear of getting sued. They don't have to be restrained and grabbed. Physically assist you to the principal's office. Physically assist you to the timeout area. Just calm down. You're on your own here. You need some time? Fine. I'll just be right over here waiting. Teachers say it's one part of the solution, but they need help. More adults in the classroom and the money to fund those jobs. We have such little, tiny, you know, minds to meld and we need more support. They say the bigger issue, why these classroom disruptions are happening at all. We do need to have some deep um, looking into why. This is our problem. It's not just a school problem. It's not just a teacher problem. It's our society. collective societal problem. Wow, what a problem. It's okay, that is with young kids, and it gets worse with older kids. Teachers are regularly assaulted physically by older students. It is not uncommon for students to come up to teachers and sexually expose themselves. Nothing happens to the student. To make lewd and inappropriate uh, comments, nothing is happening to the students. To bring their cell phones in and spend whatever time on the cell phone, knowing full well that there's a high probability the teacher will pass them even if they are functional illiterate. This is happening everywhere. Whole classrooms, whole schools in New York are known to be cheating and faking the results of tests because they don't want their school or their particular class to be shown to be handling people who are not really educated, don't know anything. What are the causes? What are the solutions? I'd like to hear from you. 888-874-4888. 888-874-4888. That's our number. Let's hear from you now. All right, and as calls come in, we'll be happy to take that on. Now I want to go to a segment directly about the real reasons to be afraid of artificial intelligence from Peter Haas. That's H-A-A-S. Who here... ...here is scared of killer robots? I am. I used to work in UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, and all I could think seeing these things is that someday somebody is going to strap a machine gun to these things and they're going to hunt me down in swarms. I work in robotics at Brown University and I'm scared of robots. Actually, I'm kind of terrified. But can you blame me? Ever since I was a kid, all I've seen are movies that portray the ascendance of artificial intelligence and our inevitable conflict with it. 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Terminator, The Matrix, and the stories they tell 
are pretty scary. Rogue bands of humans running away from superintelligent machines. That scares me. From the hands, it seems like it scares you as well. I know it is scary to Elon Musk. But, you know, we have a little bit of time before the robots rise up. Robots like the PR2 that I have in my initiative, they can't even open the door yet. So in my mind, this discussion of super intelligent robots is a little bit of a distraction from something far more insidious that is going on with AI systems across the country. You see, right now, there are people, doctors, judges, accountants, who are getting information from an AI system and treating it as if it was information from a trusted colleague. It's this trust that bothers me. Not because of how often AI gets it wrong. AI researchers pride themselves in accuracy on results. It's how badly it gets it wrong when it makes a mistake that has me worried. These systems do not fail gracefully. So let's take a look at what this looks like. This is a dog that has been misidentified as a wolf by an AI algorithm. The researchers want to know, why did this particular husky get misidentified as a wolf? So they rewrote the algorithm to explain to them the parts of the picture it was paying attention to when the AI algorithm made its decision. In this picture, what do you think it paid attention to? What would you pay attention to? Maybe the eyes, maybe the ears, the snout. This is what it paid attention to. Mostly the snow in the background of the picture. You see, there was bias in the data set that was fed to this algorithm. Most of the pictures of wolves were in snow. So the AI algorithm conflated the presence of absence of snow for the presence or absence of a wolf. The scary thing about this is the researchers had no idea this was happening until they rewrote the algorithm to explain it itself. And that's the thing with AI algorithms, deep learning, machine learning. Even the developers who work on this stuff have no idea what it's doing. So that might be a great example from research. But what does this mean in the real world? The Compass criminal sentencing algorithm is used in 13 states to determine criminal recidivism, or the risk of committing a crime again after you're released. ProPublica found that if you're African American, Compass was 77% more likely to qualify you as a potentially violent offender than if you're a Caucasian. This is a real system being used in the real world by real judges to make decisions about real people's lives. Why would the judges trust it if it seems to exhibit bias? Well, the reason they use Compass is because it is a model for efficiency. Compass lets them go through caseloads much faster in a backlogged criminal justice system. Why would they question their own software? It's been requisitioned by the state, approved by their ID department. Why would they question it? Well, the people sentenced by Compass have questioned it, and their lawsuits should chill us all. The Wisconsin State Supreme Court ruled that Compass did not deny a defendant due process provided it was used properly. In the same set of rulings, they ruled that a defendant could not inspect the source code of Compass. It has to be used properly, but you can't inspect the source code. This is a disturbing set of rulings when taken together for anyone facing criminal sentencing. Now, you may not care about this because you're not facing criminal sentencing. But what if I told you that black box AI algorithms like this are being used to decide whether or not you can get a loan for your house? Whether you get a job interview? Whether you get Medicaid? And are even driving cars and trucks down the highway? 
Would you want the public to be able to inspect the algorithm that's trying to make a decision between a shopping cart and a baby carriage in a self-driving truck? The same way the dog-wolf algorithm was trying to decide between a dog or a wolf. Are you potentially a metaphorical dog who's been misidentified as a wolf by somebody's AI algorithm? Considering the complexity of people, it's possible. Is there anything you can do about it now? Probably not. And that's what we need to focus on. We need to demand standards of accountability, transparency, and recourse in AI systems. ISO, the International Standards Organization, just formed a committee to make decisions about what to do for AI standards. They're about five years out from coming up with a standard. These systems are being used now. Not just in loans, but they're being used in vehicles, like I was saying. They're being used in things like cooperative adaptive cruise control. It's funny that they call that cruise control, because the type of controller used in cruise control, a PID controller, was used for 30 years in chemical plants before it ever made it into a car. The type of controller that's used to drive a self-driving car in machine learning, that's only been used in research since 2007. These are new technologies. We need to demand the standards and we need to demand regulation so that we don't get snake oil in the marketplace. And we also have to have a little bit of skepticism. The experiments in authority done by Stanley Milgram after World War II showed that your average person would follow an authority figure's orders, even if it meant harming their fellow citizen. In this experiment, everyday Americans would shock an actor past the point of him complaining about heart trouble, past the point of him screaming in pain, past the point of him going silent in simulated death, all because somebody with no credentials in a lab coat was saying some variation of the phrase, the experiment must continue. In AI, we have Milgram's ultimate authority figure. We have a dispassionate system that cannot reflect, that cannot make another decision, that there is no recourse to, that will always say the system or the process must continue. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. He had given us enough indication to show you that algorithms are capable now in artificial intelligence of creating their own language and making their own judgments. And the side effects of this could be devastating. And no one's paying attention to the downside of it, only the economic or consumer advantage of the upside. We're very short-sighted in either case. We're going to say hello now to Howie down in Florida. Hi, Howie. Okay. Uh, I'm, no, New York City. Right. Uh, first, I want to commend you on your great leadership in vaccines. I support you 1 million percent. Um, I believe the biggest problem with schools is that the children um, are involved in a breakdown of uh, family life. Most of these children are raised by one parent, usually a mother. When the mother comes home from work, she's tired. She doesn't have much time for the child, except maybe to feed it and get it ready for bed. Um, in addition to that, when they come home from school at three o'clock, there's no one there to supervise them. They're often latchkey children. Who knows? Uh, who they're getting involved with, the company they keep with their friends. Uh, they could be involved with drugs. They could be involved with alcohol. When I was uh, going to elementary school especially, my mother was there when I came home for lunch. My mother was there when I um, came back at 3 o'clock, and she was there for me. 
I don't think that's typical today. In addition to that, many of them are fed very poorly. Uh, they have a lot of sugar in their diet, and they're susceptible to attention deficit disorder or attention hyperactivity disorder. So it makes the role of the teacher much more difficult than it was when I was going to school. Okay, Howie, thank you very much. I appreciate your input. That's Howie's perception of the problem. What is yours, and what is the solution? All right, you have an opportunity to call and give us those at 888-874-4888. We'd like to hear from you. Now for something that will affect everyone who uses non-dairy milk. Now, we have a lot. Go into any health food store. In fact, almost all supermarkets today carry almond milk, coconut milk, hemp milk, rice milk, soy milk, oat milk. Which one's the best? Well, according to a new article from The Guardian, almonds are out, dairy is a disaster, so what milk should we drink? A glass of dairy milk produces almost 300% more greenhouse gas emissions than any plant-based milk, but vegan options have drawbacks on their own. For the environmentally minded, which are most of the people in this audience, the news is a little challenging because almond milk is not healthy for the planet, and the popular milk substitute is especially hard on bees. The Guardian did a recent investigation into the connection between California's industrialized almond industry and a record $50 billion commercial bee deaths. Yeah, $50 billion. And that created a buzz. The widely read story prompted one primary response from readers. What should we drink instead? So it's kind of a thorny issue. And for food sustainability experts, the single most important one is up for debate. But let me just share some of what they're talking about here. And this was research from Oxford University. Showed that producing a glass of dairy milk results in almost 300 uh, percent or three times more greenhouse gas emissions than any plant-based milk, and it consumes 900 percent more land than any milk alternatives. Remember, land is required to pasture the cows and grow their feed, which the animals belch out in the form of methane. So it's important to consider not just whether they are grown using organic methods. Other factors include how the farming of the crop affects people and native habitats in developing countries, the carbon footprint, and water use. And while each product has its trade-offs, some plant milks are more sustainable than others. Coconut milk, well, it has a reputation as exotic and healthy, but for poor regions in the Philippines and Indonesia and India, where pickers are often paid less than a dollar a day, the palm groves are not paradise. Because coconut trees only grow in tropical climates, the pressure to meet global demand is causing exploitation of workers and destruction of rainforest. So coconut milk, according to Isaac Emery, a food sustainability consultant, is an absolute tragedy. All right, so we check that off. Then we know that almond milk is bad for bees, while almond trees occupy smaller amounts of farmland compared to other crops grown for milk, this benefit is overshadowed by the negative impact of almond farming in the United States. Why? Because almost all of it's in the Central Valley of California. Almonds are the largest specialty crop in the United States, and the orchards cover a region the size of Delaware. And almonds require more water than any other dairy alternative, consuming 130 pints, that's 130 pints of water to produce a single glass of almond milk. 130 pints. Now, let's say that an average glass is a pint. So the offshoot is 1 to 130. One glass of almond milk, but it took 130 glasses of water to produce it. Not good. And nearly 70% of commercial bees in the United States are drafted every spring to pollinate almonds. And last year, a record number, over one-third of them died by season's end because of environmental problems and also how they're fed. 
Rice is a water guzzler, although rice milk is ubiquitous as an inexpensive and widely available dairy alternative. It offers little, according to The Guardian, in the way of nutrition and environmental benefits compared to other choices. And again, it uses a lot of water. Hazelnut, that's a good one. That's a sustainable one. It's tasty. The milk is kind of exotic tasting. And uh, it's a rising star. So make a note of hazelnut. Now, right at the top of the list should be hemp and flax because they're both sustainable. They're both extremely healthy. And uh, then you have soy, and soy is now back in favor. According to the Oxford study, soy milk is the joint winner on the sustainability scale. Plus, soy is the only plant milk that comes close to offering a protein content comparable to dairy. So there you have it. You've got soy, hemp, flaxseed, and hazelnut. And right behind that would be rice. And oh, by the way, let's not forget oat. Oat is also terrific as well. It's, a, it's the, they call it the humble hero because it's really good. So there are a lot of choices other than almond milk. Now we're going to go to a person. This is a professor. And this person is going to talk about something that's important for all of us. And we're going to be ending the show with her at this time. And it's Leah, Leanna Wynn, W-E-N, what your doctor won't discuss with you. They told me that I'm a traitor to my own profession, that I should be fired, had my medical license taken away, that I should go back to my own country. My email got hacked in a discussion forum for other doctors. Someone took credit for Twitter bombing my account. Now, I didn't know if this was a good or bad thing, but then came the response. Too bad it wasn't a real bomb. I never thought that I would do something that would provoke this level of anger among other doctors. Becoming a doctor was my dream. I grew up in China, and my earliest memories are of being rushed to the hospital because I had such bad asthma that I was there nearly every week. I had this one doctor, Dr. Sam, who always took care of me. She was about the same age as my mother. She had this wild, curly hair, and she always wore these bright yellow flowery dresses. She was one of those doctors who, if you fell and you broke your arm, she'd ask you why you weren't laughing, because it's your humorous, get it? See, you've grown, but she'd always make you feel better after having seen her. Well, we all have that childhood hero that we want to grow up to be just like, right? Well, I wanted to be just like Dr. Sam. When I was eight, my parents and I moved to the U.S., and ours became the typical immigrant narrative. My parents cleaned hotel rooms and washed dishes and pumped gas so that I could pursue my dream. Well, eventually, I learned enough English, and my parents were so happy the day that I got into medical school and took my oath of healing and service. But then one day, everything changed. My mother called me to tell me that she wasn't feeling well, that she had this cough that wouldn't go away, that she was short of breath and tired. Well, I knew that my mother was someone who never complained about anything. For her to tell me that something was the matter, I knew something had to be really wrong. And it was. We found out that she had stage four breast cancer, cancer that by then had spread to her lungs, her bones, and her brain. My mother was brave, though, and she had hope. She went through surgery and radiation and was on her third round of chemotherapy when she lost her address book. She tried to look up her oncologist's phone number on the internet, and she found it, but she found something else too. On several websites, he was listed as a highly paid speaker to a drug company, and in fact, often spoke on behalf of the same chemo regimen that he had prescribed her. She called me in a panic, and I didn't know what to believe. Maybe this was the right chemo regimen for her, but Maybe it wasn't. It made her scared, and it made her doubt. When it comes to medicine, having that trust is a must. And when that trust is gone, then all that's left is fear. There's another side to this fear. As a medical student, I was taking care of this 19-year-old who was biking back to his dorm when he got struck and hit, run over by an SUV. He had seven broken ribs, 
shattered hip bones, and he was bleeding inside his belly and inside his brain. Now imagine being his parents, who flew in from Seattle, 2,000 miles away, to find their son in a coma. I mean, you'd want to find out what's going on with him, right? They asked to attend our bedside rounds where we discussed his condition and his plan, which I thought was a pretty reasonable request, and also would give us a chance to show them how much we were trying and how much we cared. The head doctor, though, said no. He gave all kinds of reasons. Maybe they'll get in the nurse's way. Maybe they'll stop students from asking questions. He even said, "What if they see mistakes and sue us?" What I saw behind every excuse. Was deep fear, and what I learned was that to become a doctor, we have to put on our white coats, put up a wall, and hide behind it. There is a hidden epidemic in medicine. Of course, patients are scared when they come to the doctor, right? I mean, imagine you wake up with this terrible belly ache. You go to the hospital. You're lying in this strange place. You're on this hospital gurney. You're wearing this flimsy gown. Strangers are coming to poke and prod at you. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't even know if you're going to get that blanket that you asked for 30 minutes ago. But it's not just patients who are scared. Doctors are scared too. We're scared of patients finding out who we are and what medicine is all about. And so, what do we do? We put on our white coats and we hide behind them. Of course, the more we hide, the more people want to know what it is that we're hiding. The more fear then spirals into mistrust and poor medical care. We don't just have a fear of sickness; we have a sickness of fear. Can we bridge this disconnect between what patients need and what doctors do? Can we overcome the sickness of fear? Well, let me ask you differently: If hiding isn't the answer. What if we did the opposite? What if doctors were to become totally transparent with their patients? Last fall, I conducted a research study to find out what it is that people want to know about their healthcare. I didn't just want to study patients in a hospital, but everyday people. So my two medical students, Suhavi Tucker and Laura Johns, literally took their research to the streets. They went to banks, coffee shops, senior centers, Chinese restaurants, and train stations. What do they find? Well, when we ask people, "What do you want to know about your healthcare?" people responded with, "What they want to know about their doctors," because people understand healthcare to be the individual interaction between them and their doctors. When we ask people, "What do you want to know about your doctors?" people gave three different answers. Some want to know that their doctor is competent and certified to practice medicine. Some. Want to be sure that their doctor is unbiased and is making decisions based on evidence and science, not on who pays them. Surprisingly to us, and many people want to know something else about their doctors. Jonathan, a 28-year-old law student, says he wants to find someone who is comfortable with LGBTQ patients and specializes in LGBT health. Serena, a 32-year-old accountant, says that it's important to her for her doctor to share her values when it comes to reproductive choice and women's rights. Frank, a 59-year-old hardware store owner, doesn't even like going to the doctor, and wants to find someone who believes in prevention first and who is comfortable with alternative treatments. One after another, our respondents told us that that doctor-patient relationship is a deeply intimate one. That to show their doctors their bodies and tell them their deepest secrets. They want to first understand their doctor's values. Just because doctors have to see every patient doesn't mean that patients have to see every doctor. People want to know about their doctors first, so that they can make an informed choice. As a result of this, I formed a campaign, "Who's My Doctor," that calls for total transparency in medicine. Participating doctors voluntarily disclose on a public website not just information about where we went to medical school and what specialty we're in, but also our conflicts of interests. We go beyond the government sunshine act about drug company affiliations, and we talk about how we're paid. Incentives matter. If you go to your doctor because of back pain, you might want to know that he's getting paid five thousand dollars to perform spine surgery, versus twenty-five dollars to refer you to see a physical therapist, or if he's getting paid the same thing, no matter what he recommends. Then we go one step further. We add our values when it comes to women's health, LGBT health, alternative medicine, preventive health, and end-of-life decisions. We pledge to our patients that we are here to serve you, so you have a right to know who we are. We believe that transparency can be the cure for fear. 
why I thought some doctors would sign on and others wouldn't, but I had no idea of the huge backlash that would ensue. Within one week of starting Who's My Doctor, Medscape's public forum and several online doctors' communities had thousands of posts about this topic. Here are a few. From a gastroenterologist in Portland, I devoted 12 years of my life to being a slave. I have loans and mortgages. I depend on lunches from drug companies to serve patients. Well, times may be hard for everyone, but try telling your patient, making $35,000 a year to serve a family of four, that you need the free lunch. From an orthopedic surgeon in Charlotte, I find it an evasion of my privacy to disclose where my income comes from. My patients don't disclose their incomes to me. But your patient sources of income don't affect your health. From a psychiatrist in New York City, pretty soon we will have to disclose whether we prefer cats to dogs, what model of car we drive, and what toilet paper we use. Well, how you feel about Toyotas or Cottonelle won't affect your patient's health. But your views on women's right to choose and preventive medicine and end-of-life decisions just might. And my favorite, from a Kansas City cardiologist, more government-mandated stuff. Dr. Wen needs to move back to her own country. Well, two pieces of good news. First of all, this is meant to be voluntary and not mandatory. And second of all, I'm American, and I'm already here. Within a month, my employers were getting calls asking for me to be fired. I received mail at my undisclosed home address with threats to contact the medical board to sanction me. Thank you all for listening, and have a nice day. Utrecht Leeds coming right at us.